I always wanted to be an artist. I was three years old, the first time I ever drew. For a long time, I didn't believe that I could actually be an artist. I was practicing, painting pictures and painting pictures, but I didn't consider myself an artist. I considered myself a student. I run because I had a strong need to test myself against myself. Then it turned out it gave me health benefits. It is also a meditative process. And also I'm just crazy enough to do it. Hello. I live on an island in Nova Scotia. Actually, it's a peninsula connected by a bridge. I grew up in Southwest Cove, where I'm now living. I moved to California in 1962 and finished my high school there. After that, I got a job in the aerospace industry. After that, went to Australia for several months. And that's where I made my plan to come back, build a cabin, and try to make a career as an artist. I did that. In 1970. When I was in Australia, I went on a vision quest. And in my vision, I saw that in order to be an artist, what you have to do is be an artist. You have to absolutely be it. And from that moment on, I was an artist because I refused to be anything else. When Jimmy came back from Australia, I think he was a commando or something like that. I, I don't know if he keeps that under wraps, but he was very fit. And he literally threw me in a tree. He was that strong. But I happened to be here and build my cabin the same time that he built his cabin. My brother and three friends helped build the cabin. And we built it in three weeks. It had innumerable roles over the years. It's pretty run down and deteriorated now, but a lot of people spent a lot of time in that cabin. I've been in this particular house since 1973. I built it myself originally for $200, but I put more than that in it since. There was no road out to this island at the time, just a walking path. I determined where to build the house because I was out scouting it out and my dog at the time chased a deer and the deer ran up to me right in front of me and straddled this stump. So I said, well, the deer must have been telling me to build the house there. So I took a rope and I went off the stump and I made a radius around the stump. That's the section out there. Then we had uh, this room later uh, for a studio upstairs and my kitchen below. Yes. He lives how he's chosen to live is what it comes down to. He doesn't have a microwave and probably wouldn't if you offered it to him. Keeping out of debt has been my primary way of living on very little. The only running water we have is when I run out to the well. The first thing I ever said to her when I met her is, Hi, you're really nice. I don't do plumbing. <laughs> That's true. That, uh, ask her. <laughs> he, he promised me a gold medallion home, but he didn't do plumbing. <laughs> I'm very lucky to have uh, got together with the woman that I love and the mother of my five children. Kath is 37, and two years later we had to para, and then uh, after that they were all four years apart, Talison, Tristan, and Timothy. Having grown up in this house that looks like the most comfortable little hobbit hole imaginable, with a forest around that is just the most beautiful I've ever seen. And we could go out there and we could play all day long with the belief that 
magic is a real thing. I remember one time I had a skeptical moment and I looked to my brother in the other bed and I asked him, Tally, do you believe in magic? I was about eight years old. And he looked at me and said, what are you talking about? Of course I believe in magic. <laughs> because we had really grown up with that belief. A typical day for me is get up in the morning and cut firewood all day and run in the afternoon, take a nap in the late afternoon, and then from 10 o'clock to 5 o'clock in the morning, I paint pictures. There's so many things you have to do in the daytime, like you have to have the heat, you have to have food, so you have to go get groceries. So I found that it was more convenient for me to work at night when I would have a long period of uninterrupted time to work in. We should see Jimmy Cleveland racing along here pretty soon. Normally I wouldn't do it in the winter, but uh, I could do it right now. What's that? Take the paintings over there. I'm putting my carrying thing on for carrying the seascapes. Now that I got this down, I put a sheet of cardboard down that I have cut to fit there, and then everything piles on. I had no other place, so I decided to make the wall and see what I could do there. Everybody told me I was crazy, and they might be right, but I sewed nine paintings out of it. For three years I did really good, and then last year I didn't sell any. There's no traffic down there, but it was a place that I could say, on a weekend in the summer, on the beach in Southwest Cove, I have an outdoor gallery, you can come see a good selection of my work. My wife goes to church on Sunday, so I use the wheelbarrow so that the, it frees up the car. I put over 100,000 working hours into the art. It's a lifetime meditation. I think that I learned my discipline by being a draftsman in the aerospace industry because I worked an eight hour day and I thought, well, if I did something more productive like painting pictures and I kept the same kind of discipline schedule, I would be able to accomplish something. And I realized by being an artist that I was giving up the potential for making money, but that's what was in me to do. If I wanted to really make money, I would only paint seascapes uh, because I've made an enormous amount more money off seascapes than I ever have off archetypal pictures. That's my real art. But the seascapes have validity too because they represent the culture in which I live and the culture in which I'm embedded. Is this an historical picture here? That is a painting done from a photograph that was taken by my uh, father in 1955 in Northwest Cove. I could have been there that day because I was hanging around. He very well could have been. My father had just killed a snake and he made me remove the snake and throw it over the bank into the ocean. I have a snake phobia so that wasn't my favorite thing to do. And when I went back to the place where the snake had been, John was there. And he was three years old and I was three years old and that's when we met. Jimmy Cleveland and I, five years old, we were playing together down here in the summers. And six years old, and seven years old, and eight years old. We've had a good friendship for the last 55, 60 years. I remember lying on branches uh, way up high on big old spruce trees telling stories. You remember that, Jim? Yeah. Climbing up and lying right out on the branches. Like, we did, didn't we? With total abandon. Yes, we used to be more monkey than man. Yes, that's the truth. I remember we did have fights. Jimmy and I used to fight quite a bit. I remember his big brother beat me up once because I poked Jimmy. We'd go back to Clam Pond and we'd take back some butter and some potatoes and tin foil and matches, and that was it. And, and a pot. And a pot, and yeah. we would 
we had, we were clams and clam pond in those days. Yeah. We'd stay all day have big potatoes and clams whenever we wanted. And I hated clams. That glutinous, black bellied gawk. But I'd eat them. <laughs> I ate them. It was part of the thing. But it meant that we didn't have to come home for lunch. It's true. He likes to talk, and I listen a lot. <laughs> what are they saying about the Burmese pythons? Pythons are taking over. <laughs> he does things that other people don't necessarily do. Well, he's a one-off. I don't know anybody even comes close to Jim Cleveland. A lot of people in this community think he talks too much. He doesn't know when to stop. I can take a good, solid hour and a half before my mind starts to turn into mush. It's an actual communication from beings invisible to us, which are actually deliberately trying to communicate with us, their anchor into reality is our world. And if we destroy their anchor, we destroy them. So they have a vested interest in us. Is all these time, space, continuum, string theory, mumbo jumbo that just... <laughs> oh yeah, here's what I want to show you. There is the tree of life embedded in a crop circle. So each of these pathways is an archetypal pathway. And those are the 22 pathways. Each of these circles is a point of view. And my work is to show you what it looks like if you look down that path from here to here or from here to here. So when you look at my pictures, that's what you would see if you were moving down that path. You might think of it as, say, a subway system in which I do the signs that tell you which subway to take. It thrills me that somebody would spend their time in this life trying to figure out the ontological meaning of all things. And I think he's going to peg pretty well. <laughs> Every painting I do, I try to make it my best ever. Each time I'm trying to achieve something beyond what I've done before. So this is an early stage of the painting, but the basic painting is here. My real mission is to produce archetypal art. The archetypal art is actually a catalog of symbols that is based on an alphabet. And archetypes are things that we're all familiar with no matter what culture their life, death, hunger, aspiration, those kind of things. Fantasy art is a related genre, and fantasy art is usually archetypal in nature. And people use fantasy to do archetypal art because you develop a mythology. The lion man always is me in the picture because that's my avatar. He's my mythology of myself. Usually there's some kind of tension between the lion man and whatever is happening in the picture. I decided that the lion man needed something to be an authority figure in the thing, so I gave him a gun. Gave everybody else something less. I don't like to do the moment of action. I like to do that pensive moment before things are about to happen. I don't know if you noticed, but this guy's stealing a dragon's egg, and here's the dragon. So things are going to get a little bit more interesting, but I always make myself the dominant character. Like the one over there, I gave myself a nuclear bomb. If you're going to fight a dragon, it's always helpful to have a nuclear bomb. In real life, I'm apt to lose, so in my own mythology, I will always be the winner. I do my paintings from vision and then I analyze them afterwards. The trick isn't to have a vision, the trick is to stop it and uh, decompose it so that you can reconstruct it. It's not what you do, it's what you let go that's so annoying because it takes me an instant to have a vision. It takes me a long time to do a painting. I was running when I had this vision. I go, oh, that's perfect. and then. Modification, 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 modification. 
one after another. I could do it this way. I could do it that way. I could do it that way. Whoa, let's stop. I gotta, I can only do one picture. I can't do a hundred. And the painting will never be precisely what the vision was. A couple of paintings, my muse came to me in a dream and said to me, you are making yourself ill because you are so concentrated on this particular aspect of your life that you need something to bring you back into balance. So here's a picture for you to paint. And I said, I can't paint that. And she said, of course you can't paint that, but something will come out by trying. And I painted a picture. I haven't sold a huge number of archetypal pictures. I probably sold about between 400 and 500 marine pictures, and I probably sold about 15 archetypal pictures in my career. But there was a period of time about a year ago where I sold five archetypal pictures in a row without any marine pictures in between. I felt quite proud of myself because I thought maybe people were actually getting interested in what I was interested in. This room is full of piles of paintings. I've really run out of space in here. I don't actually know the exact number because it's been a long time since I've counted, but I got frames on about 70 of them. And I got another probably 40 that I haven't got frames. Try to keep them covered, keep the dust and stuff off them. I hope that it uplifts somebody, and it has, I'm sure it has. I don't have a big audience, but there are some people who really like what I do. He hasn't found the following here that he could have and so my idea is to share him with the world because I know there's people out there that would say hey that's a cool guy I wouldn't mind having one of his paintings but the thing is is that if you ask them how much they cost it would probably blow your mind he would rather than sit and molder than sell them for chicken feed because he spends a month of nights doing a painting I don't personally think that anything that I have ever done should invoke anger in anybody, but I am amazed at how many people get angry when they see my work. The Gallery of Nova Scotia, they told me that they wouldn't show my work in this lifetime. They were outraged that I would submit my archetypal art to them. And it wasn't just a rejection, it was real anger. My wife started producing original music. She plays for the church, so we played for years doing hymns. I found that it was another mode of expression to write the songs. Playing every day makes everything automatic, so it's easier to perform. We use the paintings as a set, and we do about two hours of original music. Jimmy puts on his shows up at the community center. Most people can't afford to buy a single painting, but anybody can afford 10 bucks for a uh, music show. I use about seven to nine paintings to do a show. I may try to use a color theme or a subject theme. I try to get an arrangement that's unique to the particular show. After I did the show in Chester, a spiritual being spoke to me while I was wide awake and told me that I had done exactly what they had hoped I would do. They were giving me a gift of enough energy to get to the next level. The only problem is that uh, the energy was such a shock to me that I think I leaked. So I don't know if I got enough energy to get to the next level or not. I knew it would go in if I just asked it nicely. But I've got the show completed now. I have um, 41 original songs, with all of which we can play note for note every time. No, well, not every time. Every once in a while I mess up. Let's do court disaster. There are those who court disaster. You to love and live much faster. Don't tell me that I should not want it. Don't tell me that I should not care. Right at the moment, my shows are just rehearsals so that I can actually have an active show and keep it alive because it's uh, not receiving any attention whatsoever. 
Fame and fortune's not a factor if your message is ignored. We all wish to be somebody. We all wish to receive rewards. Don't pretend that you don't want it. Don't tell me how to behave. All I can do is my best. Over the hills and through the woods to grandmother's house she goes. She wore red food and carried a basket of food. At least that's how the story is told. Her problems were slight, her basket was light, but then she met a big wolf on the road. Well, she might have been undone, except she carried a gun, and that's how come there's a dead wolf on the road. It's the only way that I actually get to see a group of my paintings together in a really positive arrangement and light. It's just about enough for me to set that up just to see what it looks like for myself. I would say that I'm primarily a lyricist. Look at that, I found a penny, up till then, I had a penny. Do your arms flip flop, do they bother with the pop? Artists like her when you pick her and you wish it all would come. At the moments I spent with you, doors opening out and within. very well so I really was kind of lost on that. You can hear the guitar. Yeah, the piano wasn't too loud either. Ultimately, my art is my show. I am totally responsible for the production and the quality of that show. I am not responsible for what other people think of that or whether they decide to come or not come. To him, it is always worthwhile to be constantly really trying to make his art become something. He's not someone who gives up. And that is where this motivation comes from, to keep pushing this show forward. I even phoned him one time when he was setting up a concert, and I advised him not to pursue it, and he, he told me to go jump in the lake. Walk away, walk away, there's a price you must pay. The world's full of critics with nothing to say. I don't worry about what I can't control. I can't control other people's view of me, but I can control my view of other people. That's more important to me than how people look at me. Though how people look at me is important too because it does affect me, because I do have emotions. It's hurting me. I was told in the beginning that I might spend an entire lifetime creating art and it may not mean anything, but it was explained to me in the terms of if you lose a child in the woods and you send a thousand people out to search for that child, one of those people will eventually find the child and 999 people will not, but they all share in the accomplishment. The project of doing art should be an end in itself. It's in the doing that you draw the satisfaction. Let your heart run free like a river to the sea. We can learn to walk on water, we can breathe the river's daughter. Put down your cares and come with me. I've done more than I expected already, so if I go in the next two minutes, what my epithet would say, he's already done what he meant to do. I'm sitting here waiting, I'm waiting for you. You don't have to wait. It's never forever. It's never too late. Woke up this morning, got out of my bed, fell down the stairwell, got a bump on my head. 
I'm sitting here waiting for my own point of view. I'm sitting here waiting for my dream to come true. I think it's quite clever that never's forever. Where that is, I suspect isn't clear. But if we ever find never, it may take us forever to see our whole world in a tear. I'm sitting here thinking of what should I do? I'm sitting here waiting, I'm waiting for you. I have seen UFOs, but I can't say what they are because they were UFOs.